morning, everyone. And a special morning to our visitors in the in the audience, digital audience, and also to our members who are joining us here. Some of you for the first time in a long time because of health concerns. We're certainly glad that you are here this morning uh, to worship the Father together. We're certainly glad to see more and more of our, our members come out, uh, even amidst these circumstances. Yesterday we celebrated this nation's independence, and it is a celebration or an event that is worthy of celebration because of what it celebrates, or at least the idea of what it celebrates, freedom. We appreciate freedom. We desire freedom. Freedom is the ability to exercise one's will at one's own discretion, the power to determine action without restraint, personal liberty, the dictionary says, as opposed to bondage or slavery. Freedom is both something that you have and something that you do. Freedom is something that is expressed. It is something that is an action. Right now we are exercising the freedom that we have by gathering together and assembling to uh, worship the Father. However, so many times, the freedom that we have is exercised to the detriment of the one doing it. And it may very well be because some do not understand the features of freedom. Some do not understand the characteristics that are make up freedom or the things that are contained in freedom. We don't normally think about freedom in that terms. We don't normally gauge freedom in that manner. We think about it as we have it. Sometimes we don't think about it at all, but yet it is something that we do every single day. We act freely or we act in freedom. We do certain things, especially in this country as we've been allowed to do certain things because of the Constitution that has been afforded to us. We are free to do a lot of things, but what are some of the characteristics or features of freedom? I think it's vital that we understand those so that we can exercise freedom appropriately. And so this is the title of our lesson this morning, The Features of Freedom. Number one, consider one of the features of freedom is that it is only present in the crown of God's creation. Freedom, that is. The uniqueness and value of this gift is seen in its limitations. The gift of freedom was only bestowed upon mankind. The Father turned to the second and third person of the God and said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created them in his own image, male and female created he them. Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 and 27. There are no other species in the universe that have this ability or that has this privilege. Freedom, that is. Free moral agency. The lion does not plot and ponder its next feeding. It does not sit and wonder what it's going to eat today, whether it wants Chinese or, or whether it wants a good burger. That's not what it does. It finds its prey out there in the wild and it goes by instinct. We understand this. This is how animals operate. They act on instinct. The dog or your cat doesn't decide one day that, listen, I'm tired of, of my owner, I'm tired of my master, I'm just going to find myself another one, doesn't do that, stays with it, he acts upon instinct. We understand that animals do not possess this ability. Imagine a world where animals have freedom, where animals have free moral agency, we would be in serious trouble because of what they would decide to do. Among other things, it is free will, freedom, that sets us apart from the animal kingdom. It sets us apart from who they are and who we are. Now, there are some who say that, that there's nothing that sets us apart. They do not see freedom in that capacity. They don't believe that we are set apart whatsoever. In fact, one extremist said it is the utmost arrogance to identify characteristics that distinguishes us from animals. Any differences we perceive are merely a matter of degree. And for all the things we do better, there are other things that we do worse. Apparently, we are like the animals. We are exactly like them. Well, that individual does not understand the features of freedom. They do not understand that it is only man who was created with this ability. And so they say we are just like the animals. And God says, no, you are not. 
You do not go to the zoo to visit your relatives. We have no significant commonalities other than we were created by the God of heaven. But this only belongs to mankind, freedom. Freedom is something that was given by God. Freedom is something that was bestowed upon man by God in the very beginning. And it was only given to man in that fashion. And so some do not understand the feature of free will or this feature of free will. And it shows in their lives. Instead of appreciating the manner in which we have been created, they act in a manner in which the animals were created without reason following their basis desire without restraint. When someone acts in that fashion, it is not because they are acting within, within the manner which God created us after his own image, but they're acting like a beast, like a wild animal. And the Bible makes reference of this on numerous occasions. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 through 19, the apostle Paul talked about individuals like these. He says, For many walk of whom I've told you often, now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, notice this, whose God is their belly. What does that mean? Whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things, their God is their belly, their desires is what that phrase references. Their God is their desires. All the desires that they have, they are controlled by it, they are moved by it, they are motivated by it, and there's nothing that stops them from enacting the, or, or, or going after their desires. They are just like a wild beast. The beast sees as a desire and goes without necessarily thinking about it because they do not reason. And so some act like that, forgetting this crown principle that we were created in the image of God. We are the only ones who possess it. Freedom is unique. It comes from God. It is only present in the crown of God's creation. But consider the second feature of freedom. Freedom is perfect in its composition. Inevitably, when I teach about the fall in the garden, the question usually will arise in this fashion from someone. It always happens. Why did God give us freedom? Why did he give us free will? Would it not have been better? Since Adam and Eve sinned in a garden, would it not have been better uh, for him to have taken that away so that they would not have sinned? That way, sin would not be present in the world and we would not have what we have right now. Well, the question, although well-meaning and certainly not malicious in intent, is not only questioning the wisdom of God, but it is also demeaning the perfection of freedom. It is demeaning what freedom is and, and what it means to be free. Consider that freedom allows us to reciprocate love. It appreciate, or rather, I appreciate so much godly men and women who have chosen to give their lives to the Lord and serve the Lord. I appreciate you. I appreciate those who have said, we are going to serve the Lord. And the reason for that is, that appreciation is because of freedom. See, I could not appreciate it very much if I knew that you're only doing it because you were programmed to do so. That there was no choice on your part, but really you're just going through the motions, going through an algorithm, a divine algorithm, if you will. You see, we are not programmed to love God. We choose to return the love that He has for us in kind. This is how God desires it to be. Man's freedom is the only way that can happen. The only way we can show God to love, uh, show God that we love Him is through freedom. It doesn't happen any other way. It happens through us making that choice. God wants us to return love. He wants us to love Him for who He is. But He knows it would never be possible without real freedom, without free moral agency. How could I truly appreciate His grace, His mercy, and His love, His care and compassion for me if my love for Him was nothing than mere code. How can I sit down and go to the Father in prayer and thank Him for what He has done for me and give glory to Him for what He has done for me when all I'm doing is repeating a code or doing that which is just mere instinct. Barring His omniscience, God knows my love for Him is true because of my free moral agency. If you had the ability to make a robot of some sort with complete human features 
And you would take this uh, robot and you would uh, make this robot your companion, whether it is a spouse or whether it is a friend. And you would program this robot to basically go with you everywhere, to take long walks in the park, to do the fun stuff together. And you would fall in love with this robot and this robot would reciprocate that love in some form and say those words, I love you, and say the things that you want to hear because you programmed it. After that robot does all of those things, after they go with you, after they, they, they spend time with you, after they say the words that you want to hear deep down inside, you would know that it does not mean it. You would know that it's not real. Why? Because you programmed it so. You would know that if you change the program, that robot will turn on you in an instant. Why? Because it does not have the ability, this, this freedom, this free will, this free agency, that's what we would be without free will. Nothing more than programmed flesh and bone. Thank be to God we're not that. You see, we understand that we are different. We are able to reciprocate love. We are able to show love. I remember years ago, not years ago, a long time ago, I had a, a when we were kids, uh, we had a dog, a dog in the picture, and uh, her name was Lassie. Lassie was famous at the time, so we named the Doberman Lassie, if you you think of a more inappropriate name for a Doberman. But she was a beautiful dog, black, you know, and uh, she was uh, obviously a well-coveted dog. And one night, uh, you know, we heard a scuffle, and the morning when we, we got up, we saw her bowl was missing, her feeding bowl was missing. We didn't necessarily think anything of it. We probably thought she threw it somewhere. The next morning we got up, and, and we saw that she was missing. So what they had done, these thieves, they came and they took her bowl, and then they lured her away with her with her bowl. Now, it is not the case that uh, Lassie, this Doberman, woke up the next morning and said, wait a second, where am I? Where am I? Well, whose house am I at here? You know, I need to get back to morning. I need to get back to my family and, and has been trying ever since to get back to her family because she knew that this was not a real family. She didn't operate like that. Didn't come back. Never did. You know why? Don't operate like that. Animals don't. They do not have that free will to think to themselves, wait a second, I need to stay here. Now, by instinct, some may return to the place that they are familiar with, but the longer they stay where they are, they're just going to forget about you. They're not able to reciprocate love like humans are. John said, we love him because we were programmed to do so. No, we love him because he first loved us. We give something to him because we understand what he has given to us. First John chapter 4 and verse 19. And so our relationship with the Father is made so much more special because of our free will, because of our freedoms that we have. We are able to reciprocate love, but also man's freedom proves that we reverence the Lord. You know, when Satan asked if he has considered, uh, if God, if Satan was asked rather by God, if he has considered Job the righteous servant, this is what Satan responded to God. Job chapter 1 verses 9 through 11. Job chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge round about him, around his household, around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan says to God, when God points out Job, the righteousness of Job, the only reason Job is serving you is because you have put a fence around him and nothing bad ever happens to him. And everything he touches prospers. And everything he does goes well. That's the only reason he's serving you. If you take all of that away, then he would not serve you. Now we know Satan is not omniscient. He doesn't know all things. Why? Because he was dead wrong when he came to Job. Because he said Job would serve, would no longer serve the Lord, and we understand that not to be the case. If God made man without free will, Satan could approach God with the same type of argument. Satan could approach God and say, the only reason those people there who are worshiping you here on the first day of the week, the only reason they are bringing worship to you, singing praises to you, is because they have to. They don't have a choice. And God could say, no, they do have a choice. They have a choice in the matter. They've been given freedom. They've been given free will. They've been given the ability to choose to worship me on the first day of the week. And so our reverence for the Lord, our worship that we give to the Lord, is proven to be true. 
It's proven to be righteous. And so by freedom proves that we reverence the Lord. But then also we understand this following feature about freedom. Freedom is prohibitive in its conduct. Freedom is prohibitive in its conduct. Freedom is not absolute. Meaning that we are not free to do whatever we desire regardless of anything and everything else. That's not how freedom works. Even freedom in the most pure sense of the word. We are free to make choices within the natural bounds that God has set in place. There are certain things over which we have no freedom or choice, if you will. We have no choice concerning family. The saying goes, you, we do not get to choose our family is very true in relation to freedom. You do not, before conception, say, well, I don't want to go to that family. Oh, no, not that. But it might send me to another family, right? I, I've seen how they operated, and I don't want to be born into that family. We do not have that choice. We are born into the families that we are born in, and we do not have a, an option to choose whether we can be in this family or that family. Even though I have free will, I do not possess the ability to choose my biological family. We have no choice concerning death. Even though some think they do. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. It is appointed unto man once to die. David told Solomon as we discussed a number of weeks ago. 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 2. It is appointed unto man. Or rather I go the way of all the earth. Everyone's going that way. You don't have a choice in the matter. You're going to die. Now you can fight it. You can certainly try to do all sorts of things to prohibit it. But here's the fact of the matter. It's going to happen. Regardless of the freedom that you possess. Wherever you may live, whatever society you may come from, whatever social standing you may have or economic standing you may have, whatever your ethnicity, you will die. You do not have a choice in that matter. It is appointed unto man once to die. And so some believe they have a choice in this matter. And so they certainly try to stop death, but it is an exercise in futility. You do not have the freedom concerning gender. Contrary to popular belief, we do not possess the ability to change our gender. Seems to be a hot topic again, you know, that especially where sports is concerned. People actually believe that if they believe in their mind they're male, even when they're female, or they're female even when they're male, that that makes it so. That is utter foolishness, because we do not have that ability. The thing has been decided before you were even cognizant that you were either a male or a female. That's just science. That is biology. And that is also not something that you are free to make God did not make Adam and Eve and ask them what they wanted to be. And said, okay, Adam, what do you identify as? What do you feel like? No, he made a male and he made a female. No amount of time and chance or no amount of time and culture will change that. Once again, you can exercise your free will and you can try to fight this fact. You have the freedom to try and fight it, but it is once again a fight that is going to be futile because you cannot change it. You can't cut off things, you can't implant things, you can talk and dress differently. You have a free will, but you won't be able to change who you are. One thing is certain, if you were born a she or a he, you will die a she or a he, no matter what you believe, say, or practice. No matter how you get others around you to say or call you a he when you're really a she or a she when you're really a he, it's not going to change the fact that you will always be what you were born as. Because you do not have the freedom to change that. There are certain things that cannot be changed even though we have freedom. I believe the misunderstanding of this feature of freedom is most likely one of the chief cancers of our society. People have gotten it in their minds, in their head, that their freedom is absolute. They've gotten it in their mind that their freedoms that they have it has no limits whatsoever. There are no boundaries. Nothing can be withheld from me. Nobody can deny me whatever I want to think, say, or practice should be allowed. Why? Because I'm free. Because I have freedom. And when it is not allowed, they are outraged about it. They are upset about it. Because how dare you tell me that I am this when I believe myself to be something else. You don't have the right to do that. Well, I'm just telling you the truth. Am I become your enemy, as Paul said, because of the truth? They don't understand. Someone has not taught them that freedom is prohibitive in its conduct. There's so many things that we can do with freedom, but one of the things we can, we cannot change the natural laws of things. We don't have the freedom to do that. But then also consider another feature of freedom. Freedom is prerogative, not carte blanche. 
Just because we have the liberty to do what does not, what what we want does not mean that we have the license to do whatever we want. This is a law that we understand is not only in the body, but also consider we are bound by the laws of our country. Once again, some don't quite get that. They do not understand that. Some want no laws, and these days some want no law enforcement, or at least their own type of law enforcement, because in their mind, they believe, well, if we do that, then we will, you know, we will be exercising our freedom. But you don't have the right to do that. Individuals such as these believe that their freedom transcends the laws under which they live. So I can break the law. Why? Because I have freedom. That's not what freedom is about. God, the creator and giver of freedom, has a different view about freedom and how it works in a country. Consider what God says about our freedom and also about government. Notice what he says, Romans 13, 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject to the governing authority. But wait a second, we're free. We're free. We have freedom. We can make choices and make decisions. Why should I be subject to the governing authority? Here's what God says. For every authority, he says, for there is no authority, rather, except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. He says, because I made them. I put them in charge. Man didn't come up with this, the idea of government. Not smart enough to do that. Not smart enough to come up with the idea of government. To come up with the idea of there being a governing body to be over people, to regulate, to make sure that those who are safe. That's God. God says, I am the one who originated that system, not the types of government, but the system of government. Therefore, he says, whoever resists authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment upon themselves. Yes, you are free, God says, but that does not mean you are free to act like a fool. It doesn't mean that. You have to obey the laws of the country. You have to obey the laws of the country in which you are. Freedom is prerogative. It is not carte blanche. You cannot do whatever you want to do wherever you are. But then also, not only are we bound by the laws of the country, we are bound by the laws of compassion. Romans chapter 14 and verse 15, the Apostle Paul talking here about matters indifferent before God. Not matters of righteousness, but matters of opinion. And the Apostle Paul says, Yes, if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. And what he's saying is, if you understand this individual has an issue with this, why are you trying to destroy them with that issue? Why are you trying to bring it up in front of them? Why are you trying to get them to engage in it, the one for whom Christ died? The sentiment that I am going to do whatever I want, regardless of who is offended by it, is not biblical and it is certainly not loving. We do not operate that way. God says we ought not to operate that way. I know that's what you think, but listen, I'm just going to do whatever I want. That's not compassion. We have the freedom, the Apostle Paul says, we have the liberty to do certain things, but not everything is going to edify. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 and 24, he says, All things are lawful for me, all things, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but all things do not edify. Let no man seek his own, but each one another's well-being. That's the law that we follow. Imagine if everyone followed that law. Imagine if everyone looked at another individual and said, I know I have the freedom to do certain things, but how will my freedom affect this other individual. And you also have then the freedom to say, I'm not going to exercise my freedom. I'm going to put a strain on it, a restraint on it. In the practice of my freedom, I must consider those around me. How will they affect it? How will they be affected? We are bound by the laws of our country. We are bound by the laws of compassion. We are bound by the laws of our Creator. God made us free. He made us free moral agents, but he did not make us free to be immoral agents. We have the word of God that acts as a guide to all of mankind in and out of the church. Everyone is amenable to the laws of God. Forget anyone who said that people out there are not amenable to the laws of God. That's just foolishness. Imagine if they were not amenable to the laws of God. We should just leave them where they are. Because that means they can't be judged by the laws of God. And there are a lot of things said about judgment concerning the laws of God. Those who reject the laws of God will be judged by that very word. Well, if they are not under the laws of God, they cannot be judged by it. So we ought to just leave them there. It's foolishness. 
Everyone is amenable to the laws of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 and 17 is a universal principle, even though it is also applied here specifically to Timothy, talking about salvation. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. For who? For everyone. So that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the matter. After he did this great experiment in life, he comes to this conclusion. He says, what is the conclusion? Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole of man, mankind, everyone. Every free moral agent is amenable to the laws of God. We do not have carte blanche to go beyond the scriptures. No one has. When our government goes beyond the scriptures, we speak out because they don't have that right. Well, they're in the government, and that's a specific country. It doesn't matter. God is the ruler of the universe. And his laws govern the universe. And so no matter who you are, no matter where you live, if you go against the laws of God, we speak out against it. Why? Because you don't have that right or freedom. Don't have it. Because we are bound by the laws of our creator. And if you do... When the following, the following warning is issued by the Lord, John chapter 12 and verse 48, He who rejects me and does not receive my words as one that judges him, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day, the Lord says. Now you have the freedom to reject the word of God. God's given you that ability. You do not have the right, but you have the freedom to reject it. But God says when you do that, there are consequences. Revelation 22 and verse 14, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, that they may enter through the gates into the city. In verse 15, he says, But outside are those who refuse to do so. You can choose not to obey God, but don't be surprised when you're outside of that great heavenly city burning in the fires of hell. Those are the consequences of choosing to refuse God. And so God says we have prerogative, we have the ability to choose, but we do not have the license to do whatever we want. You are free to reject God, you are free to reject His will, but you cannot exempt yourself from the consequences of those rejections. We have the liberty to do what we want, not the license to do whatever we want. But then also, last, consider this. Another feature of free will. It is proof of our character. I love this concept of free will. It's proof of your character, of who you are. When the second person of the Godhead descended from heaven and lived as a man, the Bible records the following about him in his life as it relates to righteousness, as it relates to his character and godliness. For we have not a high priest, Jesus the Christ, who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life, yet without sin. No sin. Live just like you and I, yet no sin. It is not the case that Jesus was constrained from sinning. That he was held back from sinning. It is not the case that he was forced to live a completely righteous life. It is not the case that he wanted to sin, but because of his mission, he could not sin. I really wanted to, but you know what? I have to die for the world, and I have to be sinless, so I'm not going to sin. That is not at all the Christ. Jesus lived a pure and holy life because he chose it. Because he wanted to. Faced with temptation from Satan himself, Challenged by life in all points like we are, he exercised his freedom as a man and chose to always do what is right. His integrity and righteousness were proven when he was faced with an opportunity to do what is wrong, but he chose to do what is right. It shows something about Jesus. The freedom that he had and the choices that he made with that freedom showed us who he was and indeed he is. In the same fashion, freedom is a testimony of our character. Freedom shows who we are. When we exercise our freedom, it shows our character. How we use the freedom that God has given us shows who we are. The choices we make, the desires we pursue, every free action will paint a picture of your character. We'll sketch something about you. What you have done with your freedom 
and what you will do continuously with your freedom will determine inevitably what type of person you are, what type of individual you are. These are just some of the freedoms or some of the features of freedom. Freedom has been given to us by God. It is a divine gift. No man has the right to be over another in dominion in that fashion. All men are free, been created so from the very beginning. And so we understand that this idea of freedom, not only the free moral agency that we have, but the idea of freedom is something that ought to be protected because it is a matter of righteousness. We understand that when some desire to take away that freedom, that we ought to speak out against it. Why? Because it is a matter of righteousness because it comes from God. But we also understand that even if somebody should do that, take it away, that we are still free to do what God wants us to do. That's the beauty of freedom. It can never actually be taken away from you. It's been given to you and you may be limited in doing certain things because of the consequences, but you will still have this thing because when God gives you something, no man can take it away. And so freedom ought to be celebrated. God created man to be free, but in order for that freedom to be proper, we must understand these features. So do you this morning. Do you understand the freedom or the features of freedom. Do you understand what it means to be free? Do you understand that you have this given to you by God? Do you understand that this thing it makes it possible for you to, to show certain things, to show love and reverence, and have you done that? Have you used your freedom to do those things? Do you understand that this freedom that you have is your ability to choose, but not your ability to choose to do whatever you want to do? Maybe it is the case this morning that you have decided that you're just going to live the way you want to live. You're not free to do that, God says. Because there are laws that not only govern your country, there are laws that should govern your heart, and there are certainly laws that I've come to create that you ought to walk out of. If you're subject to heaven's invitation this morning as a Christian because you've not been using your freedom appropriately for the glory of God and for the doing of that which is right, we certainly encourage you to use your freedom this morning while you are still able to confess he is good name, or to confess rather false before others, and to ask for his forgiveness. Maybe it is the case this morning that you thought that you have been free to do whatever you want. That because you are free, because you live in a free country, that you can live in sin and you are indeed still free. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16 says the following. Don't you know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave to whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. Here's the problem. Sin, when you're in it, you're, you are not free. You are the slave of sin. No one is the master of sin. And so, Paul tells the brethren in Rome that you are a slave to sin when you in, continue to engage in sin. But there is hope. In verse 16, 17, and 18, he says, But God be thanked, though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered to you, and having been made free from sin, you became a slave of righteousness. There is a way for you to be set free from sin, and that is to obey the gospel of Christ, to believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, to confess his name before witnesses, Romans 10, 9, and 10, to repent of sins, to say, I don't want to live that way anymore in unrighteousness, and then change your actions, Acts chapter 17, 30 and 31. And to be immersed in water for the remission of sins, to have your sins washed away. You have the freedom to do that this morning. I hope that you will, while we stand and as we sing. Yes, so sweet. 